Hi, I'm Simon K. Jones, and you're listening to the audio version of my newsletter. As I close in on the finale of my weekly serial, Tales from the Triverse, I'm thinking a lot about foreshadowing. I publish my serials as I write them, week by week, which makes setting things up for the future uniquely challenging. I don't have the luxury of going back and editing a finished manuscript before anyone sees it. A notes exchange with Emily Woodhouse back in August made me focus in on the process of foreshadowing and setups in online serials. Emily noted, and I quote, I might have to give this a try. Makes me think of Neil Gaiman talking about how writing Sandman had a lot in common with Dickens novels because both were serialised. Something about having to throw a ball up in the air every now and again so you can catch it months later. End quote. How do you make sure Chekhov's gun gets a mention in Act 1, which you're already publishing if you haven't yet written Acts 2 or 3, and perhaps don't even know what's going to happen in them? The sensible thing is not to write an online serial that you're publishing as you go, but that horse bolted a long time ago. I adore writing in this form and publishing in this way, and I'm meeting more and more of you who feel the same. So what techniques can we employ to make sure our stories have coherent resonance from start to finish? First up, let's rewind a bit. Why foreshadowing is good for stories. Fiction is a collection of made-up things, characters, plots, settings. Even if you're writing a story set in the modern day, it's still a fabrication. Given that it's all emerging from your imagination, what's wrong with simply making it up as you go? It's the difference between a satisfying tale that has a through line of some sort and a sequence of random events. If you get a six-year-old to make up a story, it'll be a slightly mad arrangement of this happens, then this, then this, and this, and then this, and this each new thing tacked on to the end of the last. That's how we all start, I think, as storytellers. It's a fun thing to do, spinning silly stories that have no deeper meaning, but which can still be very amusing on their own terms. You can get these amazing story cube dice to help with that kind of on-the-fly mashup. Roll a dice, get an image prompt, carry on the story. It's very difficult to build themes into this mode of storytelling. Even harder still to have something at the beginning resonate with something at the end, Extremely gifted oral storytellers can do this, of course. People who can tell a captivating story around a campfire or run a tabletop role-playing game that becomes more than the sum of its individual parts. Longer-form stories usually require a bit more structure. A reader or viewer or listener wants the overall story to feel like a coherent piece. There has to be a reason to read an entire novel or watch an entire TV series from start to finish because they're big time investments. That means the story has to have a spine of sorts, holding it all together upon which everything is built. Hence the Chekhov's gun thing, whereby every story element is continually contributing to the whole. If a gun is introduced in Act 1, as the audience, we know that it's going to be important later in the story. It is dissatisfying if it doesn't become relevant. Similarly, if a gun is not introduced in Act 1, but suddenly plays a pivotal role in Act 3, it can feel like a cheat. As with all rules, this one can be bent and broken. You can play with audience expectations precisely because of these expectations. The gun is an overly dramatic example, but the concept applies to everything in the story. You don't usually want to get the sense that the writer is just making random things up on the spot. For a story to have any kind of verisimilitude, all the pieces have to slot together like a puzzle. And done right, the audience won't consciously notice. It will just simply feel like a good story. It'll be satisfying. Foreshadowing, then, is the deliberate placing of characters, props, plot points, themes, and so on, at points in a story ahead of when they will become overtly relevant. By design, this requires the writer to know what's coming up later in the story. How sensible people do foreshadowing. So normal people write their entire manuscripts first, then go through several rounds of editing and rewrites, and only after that process does anyone else get to actually read the thing. This makes foreshadowing nice and easy. Once the complete manuscript exists, it can be assessed in its entirety. The text can be manipulated to ensure that critical points are seeded ahead of time. Important elements can be threaded back through, even if the writer didn't include them in the first draft. It's a luxurious way of writing, whereby everything can be perfectly balanced, character arcs are precisely timed, themes and subtext is laced throughout, and pacing is exquisitely handled. I'm entirely useless at writing this way. 
It's not about writing skill, but about productivity. My brain rebels against the idea of working on projects in private. If nobody's there to see it, I can all too easily abandon a project in favour of something new and shiny. Drifting away from a project is something that happened to me repeatedly in my 20s. Once I switched to writing serial fiction and publishing online as I was writing, it flicked a switch in my brain and I haven't stopped since. I've written three novel-sized stories this way and am in the back half of my fourth. Knowing that there are readers out there already, even just one person, is enough to keep me coming back to the page. The complexities of writing a live serial. There are many ways of doing serial fiction. Many people still write the whole thing ahead of time, finesse it, and only start publishing once it's 100% ready to go. As I just noted, that doesn't work for my brain. Others find a sweet spot somewhere in the middle, with a buffer of several weeks or months. I tend to publish as I go. Anyone that isn't writing the whole text up front is going to run into the issue of foreshadowing. Character arcs are difficult to plan and execute. Plot points need to be embedded early so they can resonate later, but you won't necessarily know what all of those are at the start of the project. Novels don't offer much practical help. They can be representative of what a serial aspires to be, but the process is so different that they're almost functioning as different mediums, unless you're writing your entire manuscript up front, as noted. I tend to look to television for inspiration. My go-to example is 90s science fiction show Babylon 5, but any TV show with a long-running plot over multiple seasons will do the job. A television show's first season will be produced and broadcast before subsequent seasons are even written. Back in the network days of 22-episode seasons, the show might start airing while the season was still in production. You can see how that correlates much more with the experience of writing serial fiction and publishing it online. To go back to Babylon 5, it achieves some remarkable things with its foreshadowing and long-term planning. Bearing in mind that science fiction shows rarely got past a single season back then, B5 seeded a huge amount of plot points and character moments in its first season, its first episode even, which wouldn't pay off until the second or third season. Sometimes you'd be aware of it, with new information presented as a mystery. Other times it would be a seemingly innocuous background detail that would later turn out to be of vital importance. The point is, it makes a story feel deep and important and like everything matters. You have to pay attention. It's rewarding when a detail you remember from earlier becomes relevant later on. This sort of storytelling happens all the time in novels and movies because they're singular creations that are fully formed at the point of release. It's less common in television and therefore more remarkable when it works. Writers of online fiction, whether you're publishing on your own newsletter or on Wattpad or Tapas or elsewhere, face the same challenges and opportunities. An online serial can last for weeks, months or even years, with readers coming along for the ride. If you're able to reward their attention and patience with a resonant story, they'll love you for it. How to actually do it, then? It's a magic trick. My understanding of magic, by which I mean illusions, like real-life stuff, is that it relies a lot on sleight of hand and distraction. You're looking in one direction while something clever happens over there, and the end result feels like something impossible just happened. Writing an online serial often feels like this to me. I do quite a bit of planning for my serials. Knowing where my story is going is vital, even if I change the route along the way. If better ideas present themselves during the writing, I'll happily alter the plan, but I'm never directionless. It doesn't matter how much planning I do, though, because a lot of writing is about discovering. The details only come out as you get to them. Tales from the Triverse is a story which... I think hangs together fairly convincingly. It doesn't feel like it's made up on the spot, and there are elements from the earliest chapters in 2021 which are now paying off in late 2024. For readers, that is hopefully highly satisfying. It feels like the time they've dedicated to reading the thing is being rewarded and respected. Back in October 2021, I didn't really know what I'd be writing in November 2024, so... How come a supporting character from back then is now more relevant than ever? How is it that a monster first mentioned as an aside in December 2023 is now the title of a major storyline? Part of it is simply just planning ahead, but 
That makes me sound more clever than I am. It's not like I had a perfect vision of the entire four-year story in the shower one day, fully formed and ready to go. And that's where the magic trick part comes in, and where Emily's quote from Neil Gaiman becomes relevant. Gaiman talked about writing comics and how you sometimes have to throw a ball in the air so that you can catch it months later. That's absolutely true, but that still sounds a bit too neat and tidy for me. I think it's about throwing multiple balls into the air. It's an entire juggling act, with new balls being chucked into the air every week. The magic trick part is that readers won't always notice how many balls are being thrown, and they also won't notice how many are dropped. Of all the balls tossed into the possibility space, I'll only catch some of them. The ones that end up being really important and resonant and fit the story being told as it's evolved over time. The idea is that the reader notices the balls that have been caught and thinks, wow, that was a really clever bit of foreshadowing, or I can't believe the writer planned all of this ahead of time. Meanwhile, there are discarded balls rolling around on the floor, but nobody notices them. The writer is the magician making sure that the audience is looking where they want them to look. Sometimes I'll have an inkling that I might want a specific type of character somewhere down the line. Perhaps I have a vague sense that I want an epic showdown between elemental forces towards the end of the book. Maybe I think I'll probably want a monster to show up a year or two down the line. And so I'll throw some balls in the air, really high, and I'll forget about them for a while until it comes time to catch the important ones. The others, I simply let drop. Thanks for listening. I hope that was of interest and hopefully useful to anyone else having a go at writing serial fiction, especially if you're doing it on the fly, like me. I sympathise. I should note that I don't necessarily recommend this as the optimum way to write a long-form story. If you're able to create the entire manuscript up front and run through multiple edits and rewrites, that will likely produce a more polished piece of work. But there's undeniably something thrilling about a serial taking form in front of your eyes, knowing that the creators are solving problems and conjuring the story into being while you're watching or reading or listening. Right, that's it for me today. Have a good week, everyone, and I will catch you on the next one. You can find lots more over on the newsletter at simonkjones.substack.com.